It's a dreary day here in my hometown, and it has me thinking, along with other things that have been happening this week, sort of like the monsoon season where I'm at. <laughs> it's been raining for days, almost a week solid here. But a lot of you are in a depressed state. A lot of people don't have the trust and the, the, the hope in the true Savior of the Bible to deal with all that's coming down around them. They're allowing the machinery, the beast system, to create in them an imagination, a scenery of emotion inside them, if you will. It's conditioned into them through their subconscious, by the television images, by the things they see in magazines, billboards, everywhere around them. They're conditioned to see this world as being hopeless, as the beast machinery wants them to see it, rather than as it really is. We're in a carnal aquarium, if you will, of the Father's spiritual realm, where we can start to look out to see what good versus evil really is. We're in a playpen of sorts, as some of you might know from my previous writings. Father's allowing us to see what good versus evil is, that we might, with our God-given free will, choose which side we want. I'd like to say that, yes, as I've said many times before, men and women are wired differently. At least men seem to use their logic to control their emotions, and women seem to use their emotions to control their logic, which, as I've said before, is probably why Satan went after Eve in the garden, because he knew Adam wasn't going to budge, knowing that logically, if he disobeyed the father, he'd die. Pretty simple. Well, imagination is how they are approaching everybody today using Hollywood, movies, theater, radio, everything, to cause your imagination to dwell in realms that are just so far out there that they've got us completely far removed from Father's simple contest of right versus wrong. As one fellow put it in one of my recent videos, in Hollywood, all the westerns, all the old cowboy movies. Did you ever see a cowboy stop and pull out his Bible to see what to do in any circumstances? That, you know, to find out what was right or wrong? No. Because man is supposed to, by his imagination, if you're a tough cowboy or if you're a really great hero, you're a superstar cop or whatever it is, you're supposed to know the difference between right and wrong in your own heart. And that's humanism. But that's the worship of the thoughts and the ways of the creation rather than the creator. And you know that passage where it says that we shall someday worship the creation rather than the creator. The creator understands love much more than we could ever even fathom it. And so I'm saying to you folks today, I'm going to submit to that emotion for a short period today. Our imaginations, just like they use the imagination when they go to their mind control techniques. The Loyola created mind control of spiritual formation. The imagination and emotion that is behind neuro-linguistic programming. The emotion and the imagination that is ensued. The subconscious that then directs it with things like Operation Monarch and MK Ultra. So let's fight fire with fire and tell Satan, okay, I'm going to allow these people to use their imaginations as to what your world is like. You're always trying to get us to use our imagination to see what God's world really is all about, as if it's completely different than what it really is. Distracting us like crazy from the fact that even you exist, or that hell exists. Where our logic, then, is basically put on a shelf and put aside. We live by our emotions and our fears and our imagination. So let's use that imagination based on the facts we know in the Bible and see if we can't imagine what hell is going to be like. A lot of you out there are very, very fearful, and I don't blame you. I was fearful once myself a very long time ago when I started seeing some of these things about how evil this world really is. I know the reality of feeling that fear. But unlike many people today, I was quickly awakened by an emotion that was stronger. My conscience 
that was telling me that I needed to stand for what was right, regardless of how much I might have to hurt for it. And from that day forward, I began to really see things through the eyes of others. But more prominently, through the other of him who gave me the life to see these things, my Father in heaven and his Son. So I now take this ability to see both sides. I can go in and out. I can come in and out and have pasture, as the Bible puts it. I can live in the realm of the spirit realm comfortably, knowing that I'm in real reality. And I can occasionally, if I need to, go out into the world preaching the gospel to others and try to relate to them on their level in their carnal ways. So we're going to do that again here and try to relate to them what I've seen on the other side of the fence that they've never seen because they've never had the courage to go there. They didn't have the faith like Dorothy did to open her eyes and see what was behind the curtain after Toto had pulled the curtain open for them. You see, I'm not afraid of the truth anymore. I don't have that fear. I don't live by fear because I know what fear really is. Fear is the emotion opposite faith. And fear is an emotion born of the imagination, where you imagine the worst things that could happen to you. Why? Out of some form of a self-defense mechanism that Satan has tapped into using your subconscious. You see, you'll see millions and millions of images around the world, and I mean literally millions. There's 29 images in every second of a Hollywood movie. So yes, you've seen millions of images just in the movies alone, let alone billboards, magazines, newspapers. They all depict evil things like war, like aliens invading the planet, monsters coming up out of the deep. They show you everything about how evil the world itself is and all the things to be fearful of, especially how we should be subliminally and subconsciously very terrified of the power of our governments. So it's pretty easy for me to say here, a lot of you can name dozens and dozens, if not hundreds or thousands of movies, uh, books you've read, so many things that have given you images in your mind about how evil this world can be in ways of the wars, the politics, uh, everything else. Things like the Rambo movies, uh, Star Wars, how many hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these movies and shows that we've seen over the years. But let me ask you, can you count probably on one hand the movies that showed the reality of using your imagination to think of what it might be like to actually end up in hell. Hollywood never seems to show those kinds of things, do they? How many of those kinds of movies have you seen where the whole movie, they're showing you what it might be like to be in hell? Never! <laughs> Why? Because Satan's deception doesn't want you to use your imagination to go in that direction. It doesn't want you to think about all eternity and how you should ignore these temporal fears of maybe a bear catching up with you in the woods and so in one movie, or a, a soldier getting you in a war, or some Gestapo agent pulling you outside. They want you to think of those things. They don't want you thinking that there might be a hell with an eternal problem to fear. So I'm going to take you today. The Bible doesn't detail it out how exactly hell is laid out, but it has some interesting facts in there. It says, where the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. It says it's there for eternity. Now, of course, I have varying theories on how hell works and how it all fits together, things of that nature. I mean, but those are varying theories that, that I can base only on what the scriptures say. And I think the Father leaves that vague for a reason. So then the, the different denominations and the different, quote, pretend religions well, then argue over whether the hell is this or hell is that. But Satan, in general, doesn't want us thinking about it at all. Satan is so deceptive that his number one goal is to teach you that he doesn't even exist, that hell doesn't exist. And so through Hollywood, through the movies, through everything, he's done a very good job of making sure you never, ever think about him and hell with any near seriousness as you do about maybe being blown up in an atomic war, or you might fear uh, catching the, the bird flu some years back, or you might get AIDS, or you might get this, or you might get that, or you might die from some space alien that's going to come and get you. Are you catching on to what I'm saying here? 
So we are fearful of trusting in the Father because Satan has caused us to fear the things that he controls. It's starting to make sense. He doesn't want you fearing the God that has the power that after you've died, he can cast you into hell. After you suffered a robbery, after you suffered, suffered a terrible rape, that then after you die from those things, then the Father can send you to hell because you didn't look to him for a rescue. See, Satan doesn't want you to know those things. He doesn't want you to know that that fear can last for all eternity. Your emotions and your logic work together to help you to decide things in life. It's how well you can balance those two things that helps to make you a better person if you use them wisely. I would tell you, stay the heck away from television. And I mean that quite literally. Stay the hell away from television. Because it's tricking you away from the realities of what you should be using as information in your mind to process your own thoughts and decisions. But I keep getting off the subject, don't I? I'm doing that intentionally to make sure you're warmed up for this. I'm allowing your imagination to start kicking in. I'm allowing you to be in that alpha state that sometimes we get into when watching television. We used to do that with radio before television came along. People would sit around the radio and use their imaginations as to what they were actually able to see with their mind's eye based on what they were having described it to them by the broadcaster. All right, so let's go there. You today, any one of you out there, there's not a one out there that I know that isn't at least a little bit nervous about all the weird and evil things that are going on in our world right now. I would say that a large percentage of you have already accepted the fact that this is something to do with the Bible, but you don't understand how. I would say that there's also a large number of you that are covering your eyes and your ears because you don't want to hear it anymore. And I would say that a large number of those people are because they're too fearful to want to hear it. Some of the very young might be covering their eyes and ears just because they'd rather have fun. It's not that it's fearful. It's just boring to talk about what might happen in 100 years. That's a long time off, right? But they've already been conditioned to do that as well. Live for the here and now. Go for the gusto, as they used to say in the old beer commercials. Go for the gusto. Live for the moment. So what we do is we stop and we think about the fears we have right now. Some of us have fears that are minor because maybe we actually have a little bit of love and trust in the Father in our hearts. And so those fears in some, like myself, or in me, as an example, mine are pretty much gone. I have none anymore. Yea, though he slay me, yet will I serve him, is my attitude. Come at it. You know, give it all you got. I'm here. My Father's behind me, and I'm going to stand with him no matter what it takes. There's no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I'm ready. On the other hand, there are a lot of people out there that are terrified. They can't talk about anything. They're scared to watch videos that you give them. They're scared to read papers that you give them. They're terrified to hear any more about how badly they've been lied to because they've already been conditioned that those things are going to be absolutely horrible to face when they come around. Rather than think that there's a God that can save them from that. They've also been conditioned to not look at the more fearful thing of hell. And here's where we'll go today. So take those fears, some of you that are very terrified, and think about how scary that is for you at this very moment. How maybe just yesterday or the day before you heard another story about how they're going to build FEMA camps and we're all going to be huddled into them. Or how they're coming around, they're going to come around with guns and just start shooting people. Think about the, the, the most fearful thing you've heard. Whatever it was that most terrified you to want to crawl into your closets, crawl under the covers, and never want to hear about this any, anymore again. And again, it's all Satan's fabrication. He wants you scared. He lives by terrifying you. He was the originator of terrorism. And take those fears that you've been given to think on, that you've allowed your subconscious to build in you for years and years and years to the point where you're now so terrified you can't take it anymore. And think about how you've allowed that to happen because you were too fearful to stop and say, maybe I should trust in that God. Because faith is the opposite of fear. 
And when you start to trust in the God of the Bible, that he's more powerful than that pretend God in hell, things might be able to start happening for you. But you've got all this fear presently, a lot of you. Many of you are close to me, and you can't let go of those fears. Let me ask you to then do what Satan does to you every single day, and you allow it to happen. I'm going to say, okay, give me a moment to take your imagination and your emotions somewhere as well. Today, right now, you have an opportunity. You do not have chains around you holding you to the bottom of an endless pit. You do not have a situation where you cannot leave that pit. Today, you have an opportunity to make a decision. But you fear making that decision because Satan has put it in your mind, in your mind's eye, in your imagination, that there's no escape now. But I say unto you, there is rescue. It's called salvation. It's through Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. And all you have to do is trust in him and follow the Father's ways through the love and grace of the Son. There will be a day that the Bible refers to as a day of judgment. In that day, the Bible usually refers to, especially in books like Zechariah, in that day. On that day, when judgment comes, and every soul is called to account for what he has done in this world, we're all going to have to face the fact that some are going to make it and some aren't. Many will say to him in that day, have they not prophesied in his name? Have they not cast out devils? Have they not done many wonderful works in his name? He's going to send them to hell, folks. Depart from me. I never knew you. You're not one of my friends. You're not, you haven't been working for me. You've been fearing that satanic God of yours, that world of yours. That has been your God. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? Depart from me, ye who work lawlessness. You've been obeying Satan all your life. I don't want you. I don't know you. And I don't want you in my kingdom wrecking the harmony we're going to have with those who do want to be in that kingdom, obeying that peace and harmony. So that day, you're going to cry like you've never cried before. As they cast you into that pit, and you're never going to be allowed back out. And as you're being cast into that pit, you're going to know right then and there, there's no way out. There's no escape. But you might be in denial for a week, a month, a year. Five years, let's say, after you've been in the pits of hell in torment with all the others, everyone else moaning and groaning and screaming and everyone in pain. Are you going to have an opportunity then to say, maybe I should have trusted in that God? Because that fear was nothing compared to what this feels like now, knowing I'm never getting out of here. Make a mental image in your mind. I'm not going to put images on the screen. I'm going to ask you to make your own mental image right now. What is hell going to be like? Is there a devil? If you believe there's a God, there must be a devil. If that God of the Bible is telling you the truth. If that God is telling you the truth, there's also a hell where the flame is not quenched and the worm dieth not. The flame is not quenched and the worm dieth not. It doesn't sound like a vacation resort to me. And this world's not a whole lot of fun right now, especially for those of us of the afflicted and poor. But many of us who have already determined that this world is evil and we've gone through enough fear, just like when you kick a dog in the corner a little bit too long, eventually he's going to strike back. Well, I didn't strike back in a way that was evil or mean, but I struck back in a way that I said I wasn't taking it anymore. And since then, I've been fighting back against Satan, like we're called to do. Confront evil with the truth of God's love and peace. While you're in the pits of hell, while you're sitting there roasting, while your tongue is so dry that it hurts, 
while the flames around you are crackling and your skin is drying out. And it never gets better. It's endless torment. While you're there and you fear the next day that you got to deal with it again, and you got to fear it the next day, the next week, the next month, imagine yourself thinking, you know, when I was back among the living on the earth, I had a chance to stop and read that Bible. I had a chance to look at the evidence of how the evil people were lying to us. I had a chance to say, you know what? I don't need to have that third car. I don't need to have that dishwasher. I don't need to have that fancy diamond ring. What I really want is love, peace, a gentle life, a life I can feel comfortable in. I want, I want a wholesome life again. I wish I could go back and try that again. But once that day is here and you're in the pits of hell, you're never going to get that again. You'll never have that opportunity ever again. That is the most terrifying thought I have ever had. And now, not just for me, but more especially for all those that I love who are still heading for that very same demise. Because they won't open their eyes and do what I've done and seek the truth. They do not have a love of the truth because they fear they might not get that second car. They might not get the dishwasher. They might not have the fancy new clothes. They might not have the ability to go out and sin. They might not be able to cheat on their wives. They might not be able to steal from their neighbor. They might, they might not be able to walk around proudly pretending that they own the town. They'd have to be righteous. They'd have to act like the Christians they claim to be. You heard me in the other videos. A lot of Christians seem to have that attitude. I no longer have to act like a Christian because now I am one. 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 They don't have to follow the rules because Christ forgives them forever. They're going to be the ones surprised when he says, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, and you're cast by angels into a pit. You're chained up and sent into a pit, and that's it. You're done. There's no escape ever again. You never have a chance ever, ever again. You want fear? That's fear. You want to be afraid for your loved ones? That's what they're going to have to endure if you don't start waking them up with yourself. If you're the oldest of the family and you're not teaching people this greater fear and you're allowing them to watch television every day so that they can be trained robots for the elite under the fears of this world, and you're allowing them to just think that Caesar is their God, not only are you going to hell, and not only are your loved ones going to end up in hell because they had no one to teach them right from wrong, but you might also go even deeper into hell because their blood, because you didn't teach them the truth and you knew the truth, you knew you had an opportunity to do it, their blood's going to be on your hands, you're going to go even deeper, and you'll have the guilt of that on your conscience at the same time, making it all the more miserable of an existence. Some say that there's a contradiction about the Bible, where it says that, the, that hell is going to be utter darkness, but yet there's flames. How could you have flames and darkness at the same time, they say? Physics doesn't allow for that. A flame creates light. Well, don't forget, folks, the Father is not limited to man's imagination there either. Natural gas burns by giving off like a yellow glow. You get argon and certain other gases. Some of them glow pretty blue. Propane torches will glow blue. There are some substances that burn without giving off light. Coal doesn't vaporize, so it gives off no light when it burns. There's no, there's no flame to see. Did you know that? So yes, you can be cast into outer darkness, which basically is a spiritual realm, but at the same time, there's no flame to see. So you can be in total darkness and be surrounded by flame at the same time. So no, there's, the Bible's not ambiguous. It actually has a lot of amazing scientific proof to it. So you could be in hell and not be able to see a thing. It could be pitch black there, which will make it even worse. 
Could you imagine being in hell in one picture where you could see everybody? You could see everybody burning and everything's burning up. You could see the smoke going up and everything else. But what if it was pitch black and you couldn't see a single thing, but you felt the flame around you and you heard all the screams and the yells? Man, it can get really creepy thinking about all these things, folks. It could get so scary that you might do like I did and say, you know what? The fears of this world are nothing compared to what it's going to be like in hell. I better get my act together. I better look for that God who says, come on, I'll show you how to love one another. But you've got to follow my rules. See, my rules teach us how to love one another. If you go against them as Satan wants you to do, that's disobedience. That's rebellion. That's someone who's looking out for self rather than others. And people like that, we don't want in the resurrection. We have to give them over to Satan, who then will be with you in that pit of hell for all eternity. There's a lot of folks out there that have been so well conditioned by the so-called science of this world, as Paul was writing to Timothy, that they honestly believe there's no such thing as a hell. They honestly believe that evolution is the way that we all got here. They didn't have the courage to actually dig into the scientists that are coming out of the woodwork, saying there's no way evolution could have ever happened. There's no way the earth is any more than, at the very most, 50,000 years old. How could evolution have happened? There's a good, at least a good dozen different ways scientifically that They've proven there's no way the earth can be very old at all. Something else is controlling all this. I would also say that if the God of the Bible were going to create a flashlight out of nothing, he wouldn't create a flashlight with dead batteries. It would have fully charged batteries upon the instant it was created. All the molecules would be aligned so that the protons and the neutrons were all... At already charged. Why create them dead? If you're going to create something, create it alive. Secularists in the science world today would tell you that God couldn't create a flashlight that was working. It would have to be charged up. That's basically their theory of evolution. Evolution says God couldn't have created a world that was already ready to roll. It would have to be charged up. They do this to get you away from the truth so that you won't think about that situation that God promised us called hell. So that you won't fear hell, but you'll fear the rulers that want to enslave you. And every time you follow and obey and sign up for and bow down to these gods that are enslaving you, you're helping to enslave your neighbors as well. And their blood's going to be on your hands too. Hell's going to be an awful place for the people who don't wake up. Hell's going to be something that I wouldn't wish on even Hitler. Yet, the Father knows he has to send him there. And Father knows he has to send even people who simply don't want to research things to see which God is for real. So you don't have to be as evil as Hitler to be sent to hell. You just have to choose to go the way Hitler went and not research the Father. Because you want to make sure that you're loving others. Hitler didn't love others, and neither did Stalin or Pol Pot or any of those other tyrants. And I would be willing to bet that there's very few in power today on this planet who love others. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in the beast system with welcome arms as they are. But think of all the evil people that you've heard about over the years. Again, Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot. Mao Zedong, so many others. Anton LaVey, Aleister Crowley, lots and lots of evil people. How many people in politics have you yourself despised? Well, you're going to have to rub elbows with them in hell. And you can exchange complaints to one another, moans and groans for all eternity. Not because you are as evil as they are, 
but you chose to be with them. You chose not to stand against them. You chose, when you were here alive, to just grumble about them rather than stand with Christ against them. You didn't have the faith to overcome your fears while you were alive of the things they want you to be afraid of. They want you to be afraid of them because they serve Satan. And they're afraid of Satan. They're afraid of God and Satan. They're afraid of everything except their own personal gratification because they live for the here and now. And if you're doing what they're asking you to do, you're living for the here and now too. So someday your reward is going to be in that pit of hell where the flame is not quenched and the worm dieth not. You have loved ones, you have family, children, parents that aren't able to see these things, and yet you're only halfway there yourself. If you're not eager to beg them to see these things with you, if you yourself don't have a love of this truth, and you're afraid to face these things, you do not have a love, you can't wait to see the truth, you're never going to have a chance to see it again until you're on the other side and can't come out of that fear. When you're in the pits of hell, it's going to be a permanent reminder to you that you have been lied to all your life and you never had the courage to check into it. At that point, you and all the family members that you did not help to spread the gospel to, the truth of the scriptures, the truth that there's a God that loves us, if we'd only just simply go by his rule system and learn to love and embrace that, where are you going to be? Where is your fear and your emotional state going to be at that point? And you can't commit suicide when you're in hell. Because it's your soul. The Father's not going to give us an easy out from the punishment. Punishment is punishment. He's a just God. And I believe that no matter how we see this, I guarantee you, no matter what your picture of hell is, how long it is, how horrible it is, I guarantee you it's going to be at least a hundred times worse than the fears and the so-called hell on earth that you think you're living through now. If you can't stand with the righteous people of this earth that are trying desperately to get the truth out, if you can't stand with them, if you can't come out from among the lying beast system to stand with those who want to be righteous and loving to others, then your imagination and your emotions, and your mind's eye, and its picture of hell that you're getting here today, at this very moment, is going to become a reality to you in such a way that it's going to make your thoughts of it, your imagination of it, seem like child's play. Folks, the Bible has alternative images that it's always trying to convey. It tells us of a time with those of us who make it to Christ's resurrection where the tears will be wiped away. There'll be no more pain, no more suffering. Our memories of the bad things of this world will be gone as well. None of it will come into our minds, the Bible says. Streets of gold, gems, everything's shiny, sparkly, beautiful, new, fresh, lively. We could spend hours going over the details of how the Bible talks about the wonderful things that God hath in store for them that love and trust Him. Why, folks? Why do you want to continue to live in fear and deny the promises of a God that says He loves you? A God that has never hurt you? A God that has put you on this planet to choose whether you want Him as your King or Satan as your king. Choose ye this day whom ye will serve, folks. 
But as for me in my house, my ministry, we're going to serve Yahweh through his son Yeshua, the king of all kings. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, I pray that all of you will wake up as we have and that none of you will have to endure one another in that awful place called hell. I pray that you'll all join us in the resurrection of Yeshua and his eternal kingdom of peace, love, and joy. I thank you for thinking this through for yourselves and for others. Hallelujah.